a few news articles. Um, this one I went and found other sources on. This is true. It's with West Virginia. The West Virginia um, Republicans in the state legislature have decided to protest mask mandates by wearing mesh masks that don't stop anything because, of course, uh, it's technically a mask and the rules aren't written apparently in such a way as to prevent it. So uh, they continue. Um, the Among the many big lies that the Republican Party is pushing is that there is no COVID and there's no need for masks and they don't do any good. Um, it is uh, my it is a problem I think we all have. Our right-wing friends seem to be completely crazy. Uh, they just live in a world of science fiction and fantasy, having abandoned the real world. It is a very strange place we're in. Speaking of which, three members of the United States Supreme Court are MAGA types. Primarily Clarence Thomas, whose wife is actually a marcher and carrying around signs and totally full in on this. And Clarence Thomas's latest dissent talks about how there's all this voter fraud and we really need to uh, pass all these voter suppression laws to make it more difficult for people to vote to stop all that fraud. So um, this is what Mitch McConnell wanted. He wanted to pack all the courts with uh, far-right Republicans, and he got three of them on the Supreme Court, although they have not done what Trump expected, which is to rubber stamp his claims that the election was stolen and such. So there seems to be some limit to their dedication to the cause. <coughs> but uh, they're on there. So quantum computers are have been around for several years, and they're getting better. D-Wave it's a kind of quantum computer that some people complain isn't really right. It's an annealing quantum computer. And what that does is you take some qubits, you connect them together, and then you, uh, at a high temperature where they're moving a lot, you connect them and then you cool the temperature so it, it cools off and condenses like a liquid. And it's one way to reach a solution. And they have showed that it does um, model the behavior of certain kinds of quantum mechanical supermagnets much better than digital numerical calculation simulating that process. So this is the thing about quantum computers. <coughs> they are very strange and they are not general purpose. They're more like hardware devices. You have to customize them for the problem you're trying to solve. And so some problems can be solved quickly on quantum computers, but they tend to be sort of weird mind-bending problems. Um, anyway, they have a computer with two or 3,000 qubits, which is a lot more than I've heard of before, and they just managed to lower the noise in the qubits, which has been a big problem. So the thing everyone worries about is this cracking our systems of cryptography, and we're no near, nowhere near that yet. That still seems to be 10 or 20 years away, but they are making lots of progress. <coughs> so a bunch of people are trying to block Chinese students who come to America to study in science on the grounds that a bunch of them are spies and in the military and they will take that information back to China and use it against us, which to some extent is probably true. But these, uh, this foreign policy magazine is saying, you know, that we should uh, not just block all scientific partnership and all educational partnership with China, on that grounds, you will end up doing ourselves more harm than good, um, which I tend to agree. I mean, I enjoyed traveling to China for DEF CON China. I've got tons of Chinese students that are very good. And, you know, I I think just closing the borders and trying to hide from China is probably not the best response. But certainly, China is getting to be more and more of a problem. And uh, there was an incident with UCSF. Um, was there? I don't think I remember. I remember there's been, there's been various uh, ones here. I know there was one with the nuclear uh, facilities about 10, 15 years ago, and there may have been others. Was there a Chinese spy at UCSF? See someone put in one of the comments here. <coughs> someone leaked medical information to China. Yeah. Well, I mean, that certainly does happen, of course. Um, that's why, you know, this is the sort of uh, closing the borders, building a wall stuff. Um, certainly, some portion of the Chinese students that come in are loyal to the government of China. Indeed, what else would you expect? And taking data back to China. So it's uh, it's an issue. And certainly, China is much more of a bad guy openly than they've been lately. Like, they've just completely crushed Hong Kong democracy. 
Now they've said nobody can be in any position in the Hong Kong government anymore unless they're loyal to the Communist Party, and that means specifically not participating in any democracy protests of any kind. So all the people involved in all the protests are frozen out of the government and indeed facing life sentences. So this is exactly what they were afraid of for years, and it's absolutely illegal. I mean, they promised Hong Kong 50 years of democracy, and they just didn't give it to them. But, uh, you know, so, I mean, there are, there are plenty of reasons to be mad at China, but um, I hope they don't end all the scientific collaboration, because I like doing that, and I think it's probably good in the long run, but uh, certainly there are some concerns. This one was amazing. These birds, this is the only example in nature of men cooperating to help one of them get a um, mate. These birds, um, the blue mannequin, they have a dominant male, and he has a team of subordinate males that put on this dance with him. And the females are attracted, and when they appear, only the dominant male gets to mate with them. And the rest of these subordinates are waiting for the dominant male to die so they can move up to the position of dominance. Apparently, this does not happen anywhere else. As you know, I certainly see it in humans. The uh, standard deal in nature is the men ram heads together to prove which one of them is dominant, all selfishly fighting for the privilege of getting them the females. Anyway, uh, it's interesting, and at that link they've got more pictures of them performing this ritual. And uh, <clears throat> Clubhouse is voice chat. It's supposed to be exclusive, and they promise you it won't be recorded, which is a mighty strange thing, because you could just turn on a tape recorder and record the sound, so now somebody found a way to stream it to another app and post it on a web page when it's like important people uh, rich people talking that want to pretend that no, their talk is not going to be recorded and played elsewhere. And, you know, it seems to me ridiculous. Obviously, there's no way they can promise it's not going to be recorded and played elsewhere. But uh, people are now freaking out saying they thought they'd be promised to. It's like there's this, um, there's these Snapchat things where you put up a picture and it's only supposed to be up for a while and then come down and you're supposed to believe it's gone. Well, somebody could just take a picture of the screen. I mean, <laughs> It's a, uh, yeah, wingman, yeah. <laughs> wingman is clearly the term. Yeah, he said you got to become the alpha male. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, I, in my hacking mobile devices class coming tomorrow, one of the students yesterday told me about this. Corellium now has a free trial of simulated iPhones online. So I signed up for it. You have to wait for approval. I don't think I've been approved yet. So I recommend everybody go to this website. I'm going to paste it in the chat rooms. Um, I recommend you go here and sign up for your free trial now. Uh, see if you can get one. I do not know what the rules are of getting a free trial, but this is awesome. Um, my hacking mobile devices class has been greatly uh, limited by the lack of a uh, simulated iPhone. You got one already. They approved you and everything. Landoff, does it work? Because I'm still waiting for approval. I haven't gotten to play with it. But I mean, my, my hacking mobile devices uses Jenny Motion because you can have these great simulated Android devices. And if we could have simulated iPhones, that would really be nice. Anyway, um, that's great. I spent 10 minutes on it, and the iPhone hasn't even booted up. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, uh, like I say, I haven't even got mine at all yet, so I don't know how good it works. Well, there are some simulated Macs. You can run Mac in VMware, but it um, doesn't run very well on PC. Anyway, um, all right, so here we are. It is Tuesday, so this is Malware Analysis. And so what I'm going to do first is we're going to talk about debugging. And then I'm going to demonstrate some more projects. We're going to do the Ollie debug projects, which are a lot of fun. Like I say, I moved the disassembly to later in the class because debugging is more fun. So let me start with the debugging slides. And that's here. All right. Just go. Actually, I can probably do this, and that would be all right. There. All right, so disassemblers just take the, you only get one hour on the iPhone? <laughs> well, that's, I was afraid it would be something like that. Anyway, <coughs> yeah, maybe that's going to be a pig and a poke. I did buy a whole bunch of real iPhones, so that's what we had to do in previous semesters. Anyway, um, so uh, a disassembler takes a compiled program you can run, and turns it back into assembly code so you can analyze it. 
but then you have to read the assembly code. What a debugger does is run it, and sh you can put breakpoints in and stop it and see just what's going on. And that turns out to be much easier. Uh, you can, for example, we're going to do stuff here, which is uh, people use debuggers to cheat on Windows games. You can just pretty quickly find a part of the code and make a small change so things happen, like the bad guy moves slower or you get more lives or something. And it's really not that hard to do. And you don't have to read very much assembly code to do that. So uh, there's two popular de types of debuggers. There's Ollie Debug and also Immunity, which is pretty much the same thing. And these are um, user mode debuggers. They debug normal software that you would run from the start button or the desktop, but not kernel mode. Kernel mode is where drivers and the heart of the operating system are. And if you want to do kernel mode debugging, you have to use Microsoft's WinDebug, which is a lot harder to use than these user line debuggers that really, I think, started for people cheating on games. So they're really nicely laid out and fun. WinDebug got easier with its latest version, but it's still not as easy to use as these Ollie debugs. So today we're going to use Ollie debug. Kernel mode debugging we're going to do later. Kernel mode debugging is more difficult and more confusing. It's better to start with the nice, friendly Ollie. Ollie is very famous. <clears throat> so you now you can also do source level debugging. And this is what you do if you're actually debugging your own code that you're writing because you're a developer. Then you have access to the source code in Visual Basic or C++ or something like that. And you, often, you usually have a debugger built into your development platform like Visual Studio. So you can run the code and see what the problems are. And it will give you handy error messages and help you get the bugs out of your program. But we're going to use, this is no use for malware because you don't have access to the source code, except for a very few cases where they actually left symbols in the code, but that's very rare. Normally they've stripped all that out, so you have to do assembly level debugger. And you're only going to see assembly code, and so you have to, it's not as easy as source level debugging. So when an app crashes in Windows, it may show you a picture like this saying something has crashed, and would you like to debug the program? Uh, back in the days of Windows 98, it would offer to open it in something called Dr. Watson. These days, it'll often, often offer to open it in WinDebug. And then uh, that is something you do if it was something you wrote and you're trying to diagnose the crash. <coughs> but most of us are just running code we downloaded somewhere, and we're really not interested in patching the code. But as malware analysts, we are going to use debuggers. So in user mode debugging, you run the debugger on the system that you're running the malware on. Uh, you debug a single executable, typically, and it is in its own process, and it's separated from other executables by the operating system. So kernel mode debugging is where you're messing with the heart of the operating system, and here you need two computers. Because if you put a breakpoint in the kernel, which means the kernel stops so you can examine the value of variables and registers and figure out what's happening, then that computer is dead. If the kernel stops, the whole machine stops. The mouse isn't going to respond. The keyboard doesn't respond. Nothing's going to happen. So you can't do it with just one computer. As soon as you hit a breakpoint, it would just freeze. You have to have two computers connected together, one controlling the other. And so the controlling one will cause the one you're examining to stop and show you what's going on. And then you can resume execution of that one to move forward. And that requires two computers. All right. Um, so in the old days, they had to be connected by a serial cable, which is really a drag because I don't even mean a USB cable. I mean the previous 25-pin serial cable that isn't even included on computers much anymore. And so um, they finally have gave us some better boot options in modern versions of Windows. If you press F8 during boot up and get into advanced boot options Windows 7, I think you can do it in Windows 10 too, you'll see that there is a debugging mode available here. Um, and you can turn on debugging. You can also do it with a um, BC edit command at the command line. And that's how we're going to do it in the project. You turn on debugging mode so the machine is ready to be remote controlled by another Windows machine. And then by running two machines, you can do real kernel debugging on machines. And we'll do it later on in, in the uh, extra credit projects. Um, anyway, uh, by the way, if you do turn on debug mode, then from now on, the print screen key will cause the machine to crash. And this was a big problem when we had a shared lab and students would try to take screenshots in other classes. And my students in this class would have turned on that mode so the machine kept blue screen of deathing every time they'd try to take a screenshot. But anyway, now thanks to COVID, we don't have any lab or student sharing machines, so we aren't having that problem so much. Anyway, the new way to do it, there's two ways, is Mike Rakersinovich, who is fantastic, a great 
Windows Genius. Is that a feature or a bug? Well, you know, technically it's a feature because you're not supposed to hit the print screen key to get print screens. You're supposed to use shift print screen. And that doesn't cause the debug. So technically, I was using the wrong key to get print screen all these years. But I didn't know that. My instructions say hit print screen. Anyway, so Mark Rusinovich, who's great at Microsoft, he invented this thing called Live KD, which works like this. You can set your machine to do a dump when it crashes. So it will dump the contents of memory. And you can then harvest that file from when the machine kernel crashed, and you can take it to another machine and analyze it in WinDebug. And therefore, he said, well, I could make a tool that lets you debug the kernel on one computer. It will just dump the kernel and then let you examine it. Now, you're not going to be able to actually see it run and put a breakpoint and stop it, but you are going to be able to examine the structures in the kernel on a single running machine. And that's the project I put in here that I required. You can easily do this with one machine. The one where you have two machines connected together, I think I left that extra credit because that's a little harder to set up, although it's a whole lot easier than it used to be. And so that's Live KD. You just make a crash. He could fool the debuggers into thinking they're looking at a crash dump, so he made a virtual crash dump. It's really pretty brilliant. All right. And anyway, I thought I'd mention this. Ollie Debug, there's a nice video from Joe McRae, who is fantastic, and he made this thing called Exploit Development for Mere Mortals. And when I saw that, that helps me move into this binary analysis, because before that, I thought this binary stuff was just too mind-boggling, and I tried to read blog posts and books about it, and nothing worked at all. And I said, this stuff is just impossible. But Joe McRae had a good talk where he showed you how to do some simple things in Ollie Debug, like what I'm going to show you tonight, and convinced me that it's not that hard, and you can do it. It, it is easy to get lost in the weeds, but you can do simple stuff like cheat on a Windows game, and it doesn't give you a headache. And then you're getting into it. So let's try some cahoots. I um, guess I'll might have moped somewhere, but I'll just log in. <coughs> Joe McCree has great, very great videos, and I've linked to one of them on this page. He's a really nice guy, too. I've seen him at conventions. And he's very, he teaches classes uh, on the East Coast a lot like mine. So, all right. All right, so this is 8A. Yep, here we go. 8A, there we are. Let's see if I can turn up the sound so you don't miss out that glorious Kahoot music. If you only get one hour in that iPhone, that reminds me of Jenny Motion Cloud. They had a cloud machine, but you get like 15 minutes, and then they start charging you hundreds of dollars. So it's like, what are you talking about? What good is that? Anyway. <laughs> <coughs> low participation in the cooch today. I'll give it another few seconds and we'll carry on. I guess that's it. Okay. All right. What technique requires two computers connected together?
<clears throat> hey, that's kernel mode debugging. Good. All right. What technique is almost never used by malware analysts? Analysts. Okay, source level debugging because you don't have the source code. All right, what technique displays assembly code but doesn't allow you to run it? Yep, that's disassembly. You can read the code, but it doesn't run, so you really have to learn how to read the code, and that's usually not much fun for people. <coughs> All right, and if you cause a blue screen of death, how should you debug it? That's kernel mode debugging. Yeah, I see somebody tells you you got one hour over seven days as your free trial. Yeah, that's kind of useless. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> the, I have some, you can get a real iPhone for 60 bucks. And I've or ordered a bunch, and when they come in, I can loan them to students who don't have 60 bucks. And that, I think, is the way you're going to do iPhone stuff. And all the iPhone stuff will just be extra credit for that reason because some students won't have the equipment. Anyway, um, all right, so Seth. And Abacus, I think I know who that is from yesterday. Yeah, I see who that is. And Max, that sounds like that might be a real name. All right, so good. All right. Yeah, I was kind of afraid of that. As far as I know, there's no simulated iPhone that is really available enough for us. But if someone appears, that would be awesome. But everything is pretty expensive in the iPhone world. You don't get much for free. All right. So, to use a debugger, there's two ways to do it. You can launch the debugger and then open the program like you might open a Microsoft Word document, and then it will load the program and stop. It will not run because the debugger assumes, of course, you're for, you, if you wanted to run the program, you'd just run the program. If you're trying to debug the program, then apparently you want to do something else, like put in breakpoints and analyze how it runs and find problems in it, so it doesn't just start running as soon as it loads. It stops and waits for you to start it. All the threads are paused. Uh, this, however, took me a while to get used to it. Um, you load something in a debugger, then you try sending network traffic to it, it doesn't respond, and then you realize, oh, you have to run it in the debugger. It's not running. Anyway, you can single step through the code. You can go one instruction and one instruction and one instruction, and this turns out to be a lot more useful than I thought it would be at first. Uh, it's not too hard to step through 20 or 30, 40 things looking for something. Now, if you need to go 10,000 instructions ahead, then this is not effective, but if you can get anywhere close to the right point, this is often the way to find out where something happens when you're confused. Anyway, um, you can go through one, one step at a time. Um, all right, so here's, for example, um, here's a little bit of assembly code. So it loads some data from some memory address. Then it puts 0x0d in it someplace, and then it does an XOR of this. It, so it loads an address into the EDI register, and here it XORs that with something, and then it increments it and has some kind of loop. So this is doing XOR encryption, flipping bits in all these bytes. So if you want to see this string, you could just put, say, you could single step through this. And as you step, you look at the memory region of memory, and you'll see the string 
becoming clear here. So this is the kind of thing you do. And you did this if you did the, um, the simulated program in that uh, Jasmine thing. There's one of these that's going to decrypt a string and then erase the string. And so you have to reach the right point in the execution where you can read it, but it hasn't yet been erased. So that's the kind of case where you might use single stepping to just step through it until you get to the point you want to be at. Now, if you are stepping through a program and that program calls a subroutine, like print, then there's two choices. You can step over, which means go to the print and come back and then stop at the next line and where I am, or you can step into, which means call the print and stop in the print. And this is important because remember, we have this issue of kernel mode versus user mode. Typically, unless you are very elite, you're not expecting to find bugs inside Microsoft Windows in the kernel. Now, there are people that do that, but that's really advanced and beyond what we're doing in this course. What you typically are looking at is the malware, which is written by a less sophisticated person than the people at Microsoft and more likely to have bugs or more likely to be what you want to analyze. So I don't really want to try to get inside the kernel and go step by step through the kernel trying to figure out how that works or even the Microsoft Windows API. I want to just trust the Windows API to work and focus on the malware. So you use step over to just go to the next stage at the level where I'm at and not try to stop inside that stuff underneath. So that stepping over is what you would do if you don't want to go into the subroutines, stepping into if you want to go into that subroutine. If you do step over, then of course, there are things that happen that you don't see. So if something important happens in there, you'll miss it. But um, anyway, that's the difference. So you can break a program. I mean, the, the, you can call it this, you can put a breakpoint. A breakpoint just means it'll run to that point and then stop and pause and return back to the debugger so you can see what's going on. So here, for example, it's going to calculate some address in EAX. It's going to move something at ECX, then it's going to find something, take EDX as a memory location, load that into EAX, and then call a function of that routine. So it's going somewhere, but I don't know where it's going. It doesn't have the address there. I can't figure it out. So what you do is put a breakpoint here and just run the program, and then you can look and see what EAX is and find out where it's going. That's one of the many examples where you'd want to use a breakpoint. So here's a program that's going to calculate a file name and then create a file. This is something a lot of malware does. It creates random name file names. It contacts to random DNS named control servers. And inside the malware, it has some kind of calculation where it creates this pseudo random list of, uh, of names and you need to find out the name. And the name is not being just read from a fixed string. You can find with bin text, it's calculated on the fly. So here you can see it's going to put a .txt at the end, and it's going to do some kind of calculation here of the file name. So again, you would put a breakpoint, say down here, where it calls create the file, and then you'll be able to see what actual variable it filled in instead of all these X's uh, to find out what file it's going to create. Anyway, this is what WinDebug looks like the older version. The newer version is a little more friendly, but not much. This is one of these weird Windows products where it's really a command line product, but they stuck it into Windows just to drive you nuts. So you got this command line display up here showing the registers like EAX and EBX and such. And then you put in a command down here, like a chat window and press enter and it puts it up there. So that's what WinDebug, and you really have to memorize all these command line commands and they're not obvious and the help system is sort of confusing and you know we'll we'll, we'll do it but it's uh it's not very friendly uh, this is the older version of WinDebug, the standard one the new one is called WinDebug preview and it's only available on windows 10 and it's a little bit nicer um, but it's not as nice as ollie debug yep yeah, that's very and we'll we'll play with them both in the project but this is the classic old one that's available on all versions of windows and a lot of people just use this for everything. They learn how to use it, and it's their favorite. This is the most powerful debugger. So, you know, if you really, if you get good at this, you don't need anything else. But most of us would rather just use Ollie, which is a lot friendlier. <clears throat> but you can't do the kernel with Ollie. So you can see Ollie is sort of a debugger with training wheels on it. Anyway, uh, so if your malware sends encrypted network data, it's the same story. Um, you set a breakpoint before it's encrypted and view it. So, um, that's the kind of thing. So here it's got to call, make some call to encrypt the data. So if you just put a breakpoint here, you can examine the uh, data that's about to be encrypted before it gets encrypted. And that's the kind of thing that you do that you need breakpoints for. 
So this is glorious Ollie. Ollie, you has you run a program. It's got a pane here with the assembly code in it. And notice this is awesome. It's got the addresses. It's got the raw hexadecimal values. It's got the assembly language. But way over here, it's got nice readable stuff. And the red is always the easiest. Here's, by the way, a fundamental law of computing. Um, every computing product, especially reverse engineering products that are really complicated and baffling, they always put the complicated, mind-boggling stuff on the left where your eye naturally goes because the experts want to see that. They put all the wimpy, easy stuff for beginners way over on the right. So the first place you go is way on the bottom right where you get the most important information. This program is paused. It's not running. Then up here you got the registers that are pretty easy and way over here on the right you got information. This is going to call get module handle. This is going to call get version. If you just look at the red stuff you get a good idea of what's going on and you have simple more or less English stuff to read. So start on the right if you're a beginner and then as you get better at it, you start moving a little bit more to the left and a little bit more to the left and you get good at it. But for beginners, look at the bottom and the right. That's where they hide the easy stuff because the experts don't even want to see it. But that's what we want to look at when you're just starting out. All right. So here's the kind of breakpoints you got. Most of the time, you just use the software execution breakpoint. I'm not sure I've ever used any of these others in the real world yet. Uh, the others are a bit extreme. So software execution breakpoint is typically what you do. And what happens is the program is sitting in memory and the debugger is basically running Python. And what it does is it takes an instruction and it puts a CC in memory instead of the actual byte for that instruction. And it saves the byte in RAM to put it back later. So now the program runs and when it hits a CC, that is an interrupt three. And an interrupt three sends control back to the debugger. And when you want to continue, it puts the right value in there and moves on. So it modifies the code in RAM with just one byte and replaces it later. And so it can very easily stop the program. That's how it works. So this is called a software execution breakpoint. It works by modifying the binary code. It's very simple and it's the normal one you use and it's good enough for almost every purpose. You will very rarely use any other kind of breakpoint. So here you have your program. And um, see, this is supposed to be a push EBP, but it puts a CC there. It's really supposed to be a 55, which is a push EBP, but the debugger changes that to CC. So now it will stop at a breakpoint. And when you continue, it'll put the right value back and move ahead. So, all right. So now if, for example, this might mess you up. For example, this memory location might be written to by the program. If you have a program that does self-modifying code, which is generally forbidden with most modern operating systems, but there are some cases where it happens, like on a Raspberry Pi. And if that was to happen, then the program would change this and overwrite the CC and the breakpoint would not take effect. Another thing that might happen is your code might have an integrity checker that does something like go through the text section and calculate the hash and then stop if the hash is not what it should be. For example, we if you're doing 128, the Android apps, we're going to do some Android apps that have integrity verification like this, where they will not run if the hash is not exactly what it should be. And in that case, a software execution breakpoint would create a problem. So anyway, those are some of the exotic situations in which um, you wouldn't want to use a software execution breakpoint. So if you hit one of those pieces, then you can use a hardware breakpoint. The processor has four built-in hardware registers. You can fill in these addresses and then you can tell it to stop when that address is used either for read or write or both or on execution. So that is a way to make it stop without modifying the code at all. And the only limitation is you only have four of them you can use. But still, you know, they're there for this reason in case you, you need to debug code and you're not messing around and you really are not happy with modifying even one byte of that code you're in the process of debugging it. So that's the hardware execution breakpoints. Um, in principle, your running code can uh, mess it up. And there is a detection flag to detect if somebody is trying to mess with the hardware breakpoints, but it's not perfect. So, you know, if, if you get the kind of malware that tries to detect when it's in a debugger and the nasty stuff, then you have a little game here where you try to hide it more and more. And this is primarily a problem for Android malware. 
If you want to study Android malware, you really have to get a real Android device because the Android malware is very good at noticing when it's in a simulator and not working. Other malware is not often designed for that. So anyway, um, that's a thing to be aware of. Some When you're debugging code, smart malware can detect that and then try to change its behavior to hide from you. But we're not going to do anything exotic like that. We're doing plain, ordinary, vanilla malware in this class. And then there's conditional breakpoints. If you can set a breakpoint, for example, if you set a breakpoint on some function that's called hundreds of times, and you need to get just the one call that matters to me, and I don't want to have to press continue a hundred times, then you make a conditional breakpoint, where you'll have a breakpoint, but it will then, every time it breaks, it will evaluate some condition, and then automatically continue until that condition is true. So you have some function that's called like get proc address, and you want to get the one of these that when a parameter has a certain value. So that's what a software, a conditional breakpoint is. It will always break, but then it will do some calculation that will automatically resume for you until this condition is true. So there'd be a case in which you might need that, although none of the stuff we're doing in this class even requires that. Of course, one thing about that is that make, might make your program run a lot slower because your debugger runs in Python and it's interpreted and it's not very fast. So you keep stopping your assembly languages spinning around like crazy to jump out into a much slower language to evaluate the breakpoint and then go again. So, you know, um, there's got to be a cost. And the cost of a conditional breakpoint is that it might slow things down. All right. Anyway, there's another set of cahoots. 8B here. <clears throat> had seven last time. I'll give it a few more seconds. Ah, that's what I thought. Oh, okay, maybe we're going to have eight. I'll wait a little bit longer. See if we have more. see 26 people in the Twitch, so there could be some more coming. All right, looks like that's it. All right, what breakpoint uses interrupt three? it, the software execution breakpoint. All right, what kind of breakpoint might make your program run slowly? It's a conditional breakpoint. It keeps jumping out to a slow language and doing a calculation to decide whether to resume. All right, what's the most common kind of breakpoint? 
Software execution breakpoint, the general purpose one I always use. All right, what item might miss functionality? There you go, step over. Step over by definition means you ran some function and you only saw the result of it. You didn't see the steps inside that function. All right. All right, that's Uti, and I think I know the name for that. I saw that name before. And Abacus, I know who that is. And Max, good. All right. Good. All right, so let's finish this before we take a break, and then I'll do the demonstrations after the break. There's quite a bit of demonstration today. All right, so now we'll talk about exceptions. Um, this is what um, breakpoints generate exceptions. The interrupt three is an exception or something close to it. An exception and interrupt are pretty much the same thing. There may be some subtle difference that a real computer scientist could tell you. But anyway, exceptions are created by breakpoints, and they're also created by errors, like dividing by zero, attempt to execute memory in a non-executable section, attempt to execute kernel memory from user land, and anything else. When you give it a command and it cannot perform that command, then it triggers an exception. So when an exception occurs and a debugger is attached, the, first, the program stops executing and the debugger gets a first chance to grab the exception. However, a good programmer will have written programs that handle errors. So it might be that the program actually has an exception handler inside it that will take care of that. So you might not want to let the debugger take it. You might want to continue past the first chance and let the program try to handle it. And then if you get another exception, then that would be the second chance. And then you really need the debugger because that means the program did not handle the exception. And uh, that means the program is about to crash and you probably want to look at what's going on in the debugger to figure out what happened. So that's the second chance. If the application doesn't handle it and the debugger gets a second chance, like I say, that's when the program is about to crash. And it's going to stop and go to the operating system, and then the operating system will pop up one of those boxes saying your program has stopped. So second chance exceptions you probably don't want to ignore. All right, so int3 is the one we mentioned, the software breakpoint exception. If you single step, you remember we said you could single step in the debugger, step, step, step. It actually does that with something called the trap flag. It's implemented as an exception. You can turn on a thing called the trap flag in the register, and then it will stop after every instruction. So it's like putting an int3 everywhere, although I think it's actually done technically with something different than int3. And then you can have memory access violation exception. Like I say, if you try to access a location that is not reserved for that program to use, that's illegal or you try to execute memory that you're not allowed to use in the way you're using it, like you're trying to execute code but it's not executable, or it's kernel man. Anyway, that's a memory access violation exception where you tried to do something in to some memory location that you're not allowed to do. And violating privilege rules, like I say, um, execute kernel mode instruction in user mode, so on, where you just violated your privileges. So there's charts online showing you all these exceptions. Here's int3, the breakpoint, and here's the single step debug exception. Here's divide by zero, and there's a bunch of them. These are just the various exceptions. And we'll play with those um, in the uh, 
Exploit Development Class 127, we're going to actually exploit the SEH handler in Windows and take over machines through it. You can inject code into the exception handlers and then do something illegal just to form an exception and run that code. It's one of the many ways to take over a machine. Anyway, uh, so if you want to modify execution with the debugger, you can change things in the debugger. You can put a breakpoint and then change the value of the registers. You can change the instruction pointer to skip over code. You can do lots of things, and we're going to play with this uh, after the break. I'll demonstrate it. We're going to start cheating at little Windows games. You're going to see how you can just modify the code to make the game do something else. All right, so uh, you can test, you can run a function directly without going through the program's choice. You can set the parameters manually and execute a program if you want to test just one function, but that's a lot of work, and I haven't done it in real combat. But it's an option. You can do it in a debugger. All right, in practice, um, for example, here's an example from your textbook that's a cute one. And this is, by the way, quite common, that you have malware that only runs on certain machines. Now, if you have uh, military malware written by the NSA or, or for military, they typically target it carefully, like our attack against Iran, Stuxnet. That stuff would infect machines everywhere, and it would connect to Siemens microcontrollers, and it would get the model number and serial number of the microcontroller and check a list of targets, and it would only damage it if it was one of the official machines we're trying to damage. Like a guided missile, it had a target, and it didn't want to attack other machines, both because you don't want to do collateral damage, hurting other people's stuff, and also because you don't want to get caught infecting all kinds of innocent machines. So it would infect machines and pass through them harmlessly until it found the target and then attack. And another big issue, for example, if you are a Russian programmer, uh, Putin's government is perfectly fine with criminal hacking. They will protect you and defend you if you, you, if you sell hacking services from Russia. You can advertise that we will hack anybody, pay me 30 bucks, and I'll just send you like a program you can run and click a button and hack it anywhere you want. But you can't hack anybody in Russia. Then they'll prosecute you. As long as you hack other people, they don't care. They regard it as legitimate business. So if you write malware in Russia, you typically make it so it will not affect people in Russia. And that's the kind of thing here. So here's something. If this malware, if you if it, it checks the language of your computer. If your computer is in Chinese, it will do nothing. If it's in Japanese or Indonesian, it will destroy the hard drive completely. If it's in English, it'll make a pop-up. So it's fairly common that it does something. And like I say, another thing it might do is detect if it's in a virtual machine or being debugged and have a different effect in that case. So um, if that happens, you'd have assembly code here. And here it is calling a Microsoft API call, get system default LCID, which is some kind of language setting. Um, yeah, the, the, the Stuxnet spread through computers because the Siemens controller is air-gapped. There's no network connection to it. But people carry code in on a USB stick. So what, what Stuxnet did was it infected USB sticks, and then it infected all the Windows machines, so that it would spread onto all the other USB sticks that we're putting there. So it was living in the Windows machines and living on USB sticks and spreading, but not doing any harm. And when it got on a Siemens controller, it would check the model number. And if it was not a target, it would do no harm. But if it was the target machine, it would destroy that controller. It actually would damage it in a very subtle way that would cause it to break later. So that's, that's, the, um, that's military targeted malware. Now, mal the typical uh, money-making malware that you find, yeah, yes, viruses, you can have anything a computer can do. You could have, uh, there's malware that waits until a certain date and takes effect. Um, what's fairly common in the kind of malware that you send out through spam to like a million people is it just targets by country. So it just does something like look at the language like this, or it looks at the IP address to find out what nation it's in. Those are simple tricks. And that's what this one does. It reads this number. And 409 is English, 411 is Japanese, 421 is Indonesian, and C04 is Chinese. So this Microsoft uh, API call will tell you what the language setting of the computer is, and the malware will have different effects. So what you can do is put a breakpoint here after it did that system call and just change EAX to one of these numbers, and then it will act as if your machine was set to that. So this is a that's another case where you'd use a breakpoint. But yeah, a lot of malware has different effects in different environments. All right, let's do the last cahoots. So we're done with 8B, and we want 8C.
Yeah, yeah, the, a good Darknet diary about Stuxnet. Yeah, there's quite a few good ones. Yeah, Stuxnet is very interesting. Well, you change it to one of those numbers you saw there, one of the code numbers for language. So like 409 for English or something. And you just read the Windows API documentation to learn what numbers stand for what languages. Yes, I mean, Stuxnet was in, in to some extent a failure in that they actually did find out how it worked. There were previous ones like Viper where they never got a sample of them because they would wipe the drive after they were done and leave no evidence. That was an OPSEC failure that the NSA let other people steal the malware and analyze it and find out how it worked. There were about five previous attacks that were apparently more successful in that they were never really captured and analyzed by antivirus companies. So it was never proven who did them. All right, I guess we're ready. All right. So, which one handles exceptions during normal program execution? Yes, yeah, Sandworm is great. These are very good comments. Yeah. Okay, the structured exception handler, I mentioned it, I'm not sure it was in the slides, but that's the window structure that contains the exception handling code. So if your program is going to handle the exceptions, it'll be in there. Anyway. All right, what kind of exception doesn't stop code execution and can usually be ignored? Those are the first chance exceptions. And I see the comments about SCADA systems. Of course, they're still connected to the internet and they're still vulnerable. People are having great trouble motivating people into upgrading them. And you can see that in that water plant where they just turned up the lye in the water. It was um, the people who run that kind of heavy industrial equipment tend to be real sloppy about security. Um, and it's a cultural problem that we really haven't had much progress in addressing yet. They're thinking about other things. Yeah, that was TeamViewer with a password everybody knew. The same thing's true of medical devices. Surgeons and people that make heart implants are pretty sloppy about cybersecurity because if they're not stupid people, but they're thinking about something else, like make, saving the patient's life, not getting them infected, and things like that. So when they think it's working, they haven't been through a cybersecurity review. <laughs> yeah. Right, there you are. Good. They're not even using it anymore. Yeah, that happens a lot. Yeah. Anyway. Um, all right, and uh, there's one more of these. See a lot of good comments there. All right, a Ring 3 process tries to access hardware directly. So what will happen? Oh yeah, the first few times you use Shodan, it's horrible. You can find, I found a factory making tomato sauce in Italy. There's just all kinds of stuff just wide open on Shodan. <laughs> One time I found a company in Texas printing checks. All right. Um, that's a privilege violation. All right. So let's get these answers. That's another one for Max. All right. And another one for Uddy. And 
Hema. All right, I've gotten those names. Not sure I know who they all are, but I think I know who quite a few of them are. All right, and there's a couple more questions to answer here. She said, uh, the heart monitors, the heart implants and other medical devices tend to have terrible cybersecurity. They, um, like there's one that just came out. If you get the new iPhone 12, the magnet is so strong that if you have a pacemaker, it'll stop your pacemaker because just a simple magnetic signal will turn it off. And um, Sandworm is a book which explains... Um, a lot of these attacks, I think, including Stuxnet. So it's a good book to get, good book to read. It explains it. And APT is Advanced Persistent Threat, which is this military advanced malware. Yeah, there should be a cybersecurity basics. Well, yeah, maybe there should. It's a good point, Oblivia. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, I'll pick up at 10 after 7. We'll take a 10 minute break and then I'm going to demonstrate some projects. And they're very good, fun projects today using Ollie Debug, which is always a big hit. I think the book is called Sandworm, isn't it? Somebody up there knows.